This is one episode where I started off on one topic and uh, wound up with something else. I'm going to be uploading some obscure fights that I'm pretty sure uh, most of you haven't seen before, and some classic fights with some historical tidbits. Uh, this episode, I was going to showcase a few fights of uh, Robert Bam Bam Hines, but realized that one of his opponents, Donald Bowers, was a murder victim. So I decided to do a little digging and went down a rabbit hole that I thought I'd share. Uh, I remember seeing Bowers' photo in the Kronk boxing team advertisements in the old boxing magazines uh, back then in the uh, early 80s. The Kronk, the Kronk was one of the most feared stables in boxing. So if Bowers was part of that team, then I figured he must be good. Uh, but Bowers wasn't a product of Detroit. He came out of Jackson, Tennessee and was part of an amateur stable out of that area that was very good, you know, led by a trainer named uh, Rayford Collins. Bowers fought out of a gym that included other amateur standouts such as uh, Jackie and Ricky Beard. Uh, Bowers never completed high school and focused solely on boxing in his teenage years, uh, winning his division in the Junior Olympics in 1978. Uh, he won a national Golden Gloves title, and at one point he was the number one rated amateur in the 156-pound weight class, uh, defeating the likes of Tyrone Rackley and James Hardrock Green, in addition to defeating some top Russian boxers. Uh, he said, quote, I never intended to be a boxer. It just happened. I went to the gym to lose weight, but I started winning and kept winning. All of a sudden, we were in the spotlight, and it was fun. The next thing I knew, I was flying all over the world to fight. My life turned 180 degrees. But there was trouble behind the scenes. Bowers began having brushes with the law at least as early as 1978. Uh, there were DUIs and drug possession charges that Coach Collins wasn't fully apprised of until Bowers and a teammate destroyed some motel property during a road trip. Collins kicked Bowers off the team uh, until Bowers did some cleanup work at the club to pay for the damages. Uh, Bowers did regroup. He made it to the Olympic trials where he lost to James Schuler in the semifinals. And seven months later, he turned pro at the Coliseum in Jackson, Tennessee. Now, he racked up 16 straight wins. But at some point in 1983, he began getting frustrated with the sport. He wasn't progressing as fast as he wanted to, and his discipline suffered. He got a draw with Wayne Powell, a bout in which his own trainer thought he lost. And Bowers began struggling with weight, having numerous fights canceled because of it, uh, once showing up in Detroit for a fight over 26 pounds over the contracted weight limit. At this point, he was with Emmanuel Stewart at the Kronk Gym, but felt he was reduced to second-class status by Stewart because of all the talent in the gym. Bowers is quoted as saying, If you don't have the right connections and pool, you could be the best in the world and not get a chance to prove it. But his old trainer, Collins, disagreed, believing that Bowers needed someone like Stewart to really push him. Donald has gone as far as he can, Collins said. Unless he gets a trainer, is obedient, and disciplines himself. Otherwise, he's going nowhere. And that's exactly where Bowers wound up, as in January of 1984, uh, he lost a one-sided decision to Curtis Parker, and in July of 1985, he lost a decision to future champion Sumbu Kalambe, uh, suffering a detached retina after the loss. Now, Bowers had no money, no insurance, and without boxing, he didn't have a job. So he was now looking at over $18,000 in medical bills. Now, he does find a job, he injures his ankle, and now he's forced to return to the ring after a two-year layoff when he wins uh, two fights before losing a split decision to uh, Franklin Owens. A month later, he secured a televised date against a top contender and future champion in Robert Hines in uh, August of 1987. A bit confusing for Donald Bowers. Southpaws are always confusing. Our main event, the first round of the junior middleweight 10-round bout. Live from Philadelphia, we're glad you're with us with Randy Gordon, I'm Steve Grab, and we have had two good bouts prior to this. And both these boxers have a lot to prove tonight, as we told you at the top of our broadcast. Manager Kerry Farr told Donald Bowers moments before the opening bell goes straight to him. Let's see if he listens. Bowers in the gold truck facing on the left now. Robert Hines knows what to expect. He is well prepared. For a quick start because when we saw him back in June, Anthony Wildcat Wiley took the fight right to him at the opening bell. And by the 22nd mark or so, had Hines in trouble from a big right hand. 
Ryan's still bearing a scar under his left eye from that Wiley fight, but he says it's from a butt. Well, that's been there for a while, but it continually opens. And it's a good point. Let's watch it. So many times he takes a shot there, or a few shots, maybe an easy headbutt, and that cut or that scar tissue opens up. 145 to go in the first round. Both fighters exchange body shots. This is Bowers boring in. Randy, I want to ask you real quickly here early in the going. Both boxers with a cut, by the way, opened on Bowers' face. The top of his nose on the bridge. You know how important this is at the stepping stone of their careers. What would happen to the losers? What are they trying to avoid? They both have pretty good records on paper. But what is it that they desperately don't want to be labeled as? Well, a loss here today, I think especially for Robert Hines, will label him as, well, you got to continue that comeback, and maybe you are nothing more than a stepping stone. He's already rated number 10 by the WBA, and a loss here would be devastating to him. Manager Sam Ingerman is ready to put him into a title fight if he can get it. He wants Lupe Aquino, the WBC super welterweight champion. Incidentally, you can't see it, but a couple of locusts Giant grasshoppers are in the ring flying around in there. The doors are open here tonight. It's summertime in Philadelphia, and it's extremely hot with 28 seconds to go in the opening of a 10-rounder, the opening round. That's Bowers and Gold with his back team. Well, Bowers I guarantee you this. Neither guy tonight is going to be fighting like a grasshopper. They're going to be on top of each other in this tremendous heat. There's still blood over the left eye of Donald Bowers. We'll have to work on that as round one comes to its conclusion. It was back to you in the gold on the left, and that's Robert Hines in the white. How did you score the first round? I gave it to Robert Bam Bam Hines, 5-4. He got off to a nice start. But Bowers did not do too bad. He was able to put the pressure on, he got close, and he's able to start sizing up the strength and the speed of Bam Bam. Nice right hook by Hines. A couple of quick steps to the base of Bowers, trying to open that cut over that eye again. These guys stand on top of each other like this. There will be blood before too long. He's holding up okay so far on top of Bowers' left eye. The wrestling type. Both with that heavy scar tissue. Bam Bam above the left eye. Bowers above his eye. Bad place for Bam Bam to be against the ropes, because that's where he'll get Bam Bam. A little swelling from that scar that he sustained in his last fight, but so far no blood on Hines. Nice right by Hines. It was a stiff right, and it hurt Bounds. This the year of the comeback, led by Sugar Ray Leonard, George Foreman. And that time! continues to pummel away. There were two free shots in there, and they were hurting shots. Bowers is through. Rudy Battle telling him it's over, and Hines on his comeback trail wins again. Second round. Let's see exactly what happened. Bam Bam jumped in with his best punch. A solid left hand, and that was the one that sent Bowers down. Now watch this, one shot, two shots, clean shots. Referee Rudy Battle was lucky he got in there when he did, because there could have been another shot following that one. Good, solid left hand. Now that's the one that sends Bowers down. He, he goes against the ropes. It looked like he was actually more off balance there than he was hurt. But I believe it was the two follow-up shots, which were the ones that really put him into trouble. Again, different angle. You see that left hand there. That's the one that sent him into the ropes. It looked like his right ankle turned a bit underneath him. Oh, he yeah. got tangled up in the ropes like, a, like an insect in a spider web. And then two more hard left hands. I don't know about that finish, Steve. Now, the fight was later declared as a no-contest affair, but uh, Bowers never returned to the ring. His life took a turn for the worse, as less than two years later he was arrested for assault, 
and public drunkenness, uh, the arrest for assaults and drug possession continued for a few years before Rayford Collins once again took him in, uh, allowing him to become a trainer at the Jackson Boxing Club. Uh, Bowers then took over head training duties by 2009, but the drug problems escalated as he was arrested multiple times for a cocaine and marijuana possession. And Collins then had to do what he felt was the hardest thing he had to do in life, fire Bowers and send him back onto the streets. Now, Collins' decision to fire Bowers came after months of watching the fighter have visitors at the gym that he, quote, exchanged things with. Uh, Bowers had lost control of the workouts at the gym, and the fighters were not receiving the necessary instruction for an upcoming tournament. The conversation Collins had when he fired Bowers was the last time he spoke to the former fighter. A Bowers was stopped by police. He had slurred speech and was trying to swallow something in his mouth. Uh, after refusing to spit out what was in his mouth, officers resorted to spraying him with a chemical weapon. A Bowers then spit out a plastic bag with one gram of cocaine inside. A short time later, Bowers was found dead from a gunshot wound in his home in Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, he was 52 years old. Uh, investigators said there were no signs of a forced entry and to date, it doesn't appear that authorities have caught his killer, let alone identified any suspects. So that is the story of Donald Bowers, of one of the top amateurs from the early 1980s, who is now on the uh, list of the Tennessee's unsolved homicides.